I'm Matthew Bakovic, a technical manager here at, at CERT. Uh, this afternoon, we're joined by a distinguished panel of, uh, from five organizations, all of which are using the CERT RMM, are going to share with us their experiences um, and also insights regarding what works best and where the high spots are when trying to use the CERT RMM. We're joined by Jason Christopher. Jason is an electricity subsector technical lead for cybersecurity capabilities and risk management at the U.S. Department of Energy. We're joined by Kevin Dillon, Branch Chief for Stakeholder Risk Assessment and Mitigation with the Department of Homeland Security's National Protection and Programs Directorate. We're joined by Michael Ray, Assistant Inspector in Charge, Revenue, Product, and Cybersecurity with the United States Postal Inspection Service. We're joined by William David, a Senior Program Manager with Lockheed Martin and the Corporation's Business, business Resiliency Leader. We're also joined by Chris Berger, who is a business development executive with, with SunGuard Consulting. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So thank you for making time to, uh, to participate in the, the panel this afternoon. I um, want to ask Jason the first question, and then we'll go around the horn. Uh, what problem were you trying to solve within your organization when you considered using CERT RMM? Thank you, Matt, and uh, thank you for having me here today. So it was actually kind of an interesting dialogue that led up to uh, the work with the RMM, which uh, became the cybersecurity capability maturity model, which is what we ended up developing as a, as a product. Um, the question was, how secure is the grid? Um, it's a little bit of a, of a fuzzy question, as you can imagine. Um, and so what we did is we, we tried to look at the different uh, capabilities that were out there, which led us down the path of looking at capability maturity models. Um, we then brought CERT into the room, started having a dialogue, and RMM was one of the first um, products that we had ended up looking at to adapt for the sector in a way that they could utilize. Um, and so from there, we ended up in a very quick period, a five-month period, uh, coming up with a, a version a, that leveraged uh, the RMM for the sector, um, as well as a methodology to self-assess uh, where you are in terms of your capability maturity for cybersecurity. Thank you, Jason. Same question for Michael. What, what problem were you trying to, to solve, or what, what, what challenge were you addressing when you considered using RMM? Sure, thanks, Matt. Um, so within the Postal Inspection Service, three of the programs that we had back in 2011 that we still have today included um, our global security, our export screening, and then also our cyber investigations program. Um, what we were looking at is we engaged CERT with from the perspective of a level of maturity for those three programs to see whether or not, from a baseline perspective, if we could identify any gaps because we were pursuing the expansion of those three programs. Um, so what, what CERT RMM allowed us to do is it actually gave us, gave us the capability to assess from a baseline perspective, identify certain gaps so that we could address uh, certain solutions going forward as we expanded those three programs for the organization. Okay. And the same question for Kevin. Well, thanks, Matt. So uh, our, ours dates back to 2009, and uh, we were asked as um, part of NPPD, the Office of Infrastructure Protection, had a uh, pilot project going on called the Regional Resilience Assessment Program. So that's where they take, uh, you know, um, a large cluster of critical infrastructure. It could be state and local. It could be private sector. And they were um, focused on the resilience aspects of that uh, and had a physical security flair to it. Um, they came to our office asking if uh, we had a you know, set of cyber questions or, or things to look at when it came to cyber resilience. Uh, we didn't have anything baked or built at the time, but had the existing re relationship with uh, SDI and the resilience management model was, was brought up as a potential uh, way to develop this question set. So, you know, obviously the, with the focus on resilience and has um, aspects of IT security, IT operations, business continuity to it, um, that really spawned the initiation of uh, the program where we do evaluations and, and was, you know, the foundation of what built the, um, you know, the derivative piece of work that we use when working with critical infrastructure. Again, it was trying to look at a holistic, both physical and cyber resilience of these um, critical infrastructure pockets, if you will, uh, as part of that RRAP. But that RRAP process then, again, spawned uh, a capability within the department. So. Um, that's really how we got at it and, you know, basically a requirement from another organization to um, look at cyber resilience and what that means to these um, uh, critical infrastructure. Thanks, Kevin. Chris, same question for you. What were the, uh, the challenges or the drivers that your organization was experiencing when you, when you considered RMM? Yeah, thanks, Matt. So um, I've been working with the RMM team for a number of years now, and um, 
you know, within our consulting group, our, our whole mission is to help customers stay highly available with their IT. So uh, a few years back, um, having been familiar with RMM, um, you know, we, we looked at the model to help us take our customers to the next level. So we, we look at the model as a tool to help our customers have an enterprise-wide view of the resilience program. And, you know, we have separate practices that do business continuity and disaster recovery and information security. So the model was a great fit to, to help us take some of our more mature customers to the next level. And so that's what we use the tool for. Thank you. And, and Bill, could you share with us um, insights regarding your organization's, cha the challenges you were addressing when you considered RMM? Uh, here at Lockheed Martin back in 2009, uh, we realized that we needed to improve our capability for uh, preparedness in the areas of IT disaster recovery and business continuity. And at the time, we commissioned an internal study to look at, that, look at those practices in a very detailed way. This was an excellent characterization, but at a single point in time. What we realized we needed to do was to create a cost-effective but repeatable measurement capability. Uh, and in order to do that, we wanted to use an existing capability maturity model, uh, which had an integrated measurement capability. And as we looked at that space, resilience management model was the thing that fit the bill. Thank you. The related question, and I'll, I'll first uh, ask this of, of Jason. Um, so you've explained the challenges that, uh, that the organization um, was addressing when, when considering RMM. Why did you ultimately choose to, uh, to use RMM or elements of RMM in your approach? To be honest, it was uh, just the way that, as many of the other speakers have discussed, uh, to not only be able to establish some sort of baseline, but also be able to help out more mature organizations at the same time. Um, we, we view that as, as actually a really large benefit for the sector. Within uh, the energy sector itself, electricity in particular, where we started this project, uh, we already have mandatory cybersecurity standards, and that has been treated time and time again as a regulatory floor. And so when discussing how secure is the grid, looking at what is a regulation, what is the floor for that cybersecurity, um, wouldn't exactly be the, the best metric to be, um, be discussing. So the RMM allowed us to be able to tailor for our sector an approach that not only built in cybersecurity, but also looked at uh, disaster recovery, continuity of operations, and other aspects that were typically even siloed from security within the energy sector. And so being able to have that in one assessment methodology was really um, a great benefit that we were able to leverage within the sector. So Jason, it's fair to say that convergence was important, the fact that you're bringing together these various pieces uh, of, of IT operations, business continuity, um, into a single, Absolutely. single framework. So, so Chris, the same question. Why ultimately did you choose RMM? Uh, well, a lot the same reasons, Jason, and I, I would extend it to you know basically any industry, particularly if they have, um, particularly if they have more mature silo programs with business continuity, disaster recovery, and infosec. Um, you know, if any of those silos are not as mature, it's still a great model, a great foundation because. Um, you know, the process improvement approach is really good, but, you know, I think key to the answer to your specific question mm -hmm. is it, it's a great, I don't know what the right word is, I like to say meta model. In other words, you know, the business continuity folks will talk about 17999, they'll talk about 22301, yeah, ICE, uh, InfoSec guys will talk about 27000, you know, the DR folks might go ISO route and cloud folks are off in the cloud doing something else. But to bring them all together, and, and, you know, I work with business continuity VR folks all the time, and generally they don't even want to talk to the IS guys, right? And so here's, here's a way to, to, to talk about all of those disciplines in, in, a, in, a, in a kind of a neutral way because we're saying, look, we're not replacing 22301 or 27,000. We're not replacing anything. We're, we're, we're saying here's a process improvement approach that everybody can get on board with and work together. And so... Uh, that, that's the thing that's been resonating, at least with our customers. Again, I'll say for the more mature customers, I think it's going to take a while to, to push down to the less mature customers. So it sounds, uh, Chris, like you're, you're describing a situation where you weren't, you were able to augment rather than replace. Exactly, exactly. Uh, Bill, can you give us the perspective from Lockheed Martin? Again, as I said, uh, our primary focus going in, we thought what we wanted to use RMM for was to do measurements. Uh, mm -hmm. We learned later there was a lot more that we could do with it, so we'll, we'll get to that maybe in another question. But sure. when we looked at the space, we, we evaluated a number of standards. And what we found at the time, again, this is four or five years ago, that others were either incomplete 
proprietary and we couldn't really use them without paying a lot of money, or they were inconsistent with the standards, as Chris was just mentioning, RMM is very consistent with standards. Uh, so RMM was the most promising. It was comprehensive, uh, publicly, publicly available, and most importantly to us at the time, it had a repeatable appraisal method associated with it, much like CMMI with the Scampi appraisal method, a uh, similar process but adjusted for RMM. So, so that was why we initially selected it. Again, um, we'll maybe talk a little bit later about what else we did with it besides measurement. Sure. I think it's a good segue to ask questions of, of, of both uh, Mike and, and Kevin, which are your organizations are, are doing assessment appraisal with RMM. So let's, let's first uh, get Michael's perspective on that. Uh, which is why ultimately RMM. So just to kind of uh, echo what Bill was just talking about, the RMM, the approach itself and the methodology is very comprehensive. So um, one of the other facets of our work is we, we evaluate, constantly evaluate products and services that are being, being brought to market for the organization. Um, so we needed an effective tool that was actually comprehensive um, and, and not necessarily like as Chris talked about, that silent approach. So what it enabled us to do is actually um, almost like a buffet style, looking at those 26 process areas, pick and choose which elements or processes that would apply for the evaluation of risk um, for the organization for a new product or enhanced product before it went to market. And that also enabled us to better identify those key stakeholders that we need to engage and bring to the table where we're, we don't have those skills within the investigative arena to talk about what are the risks that are outside of our purview and our, our level of expertise, so bring those other folks to the table to talk about what are the goals and practices that we need to uh, deploy for these new products. Great, thank you. And Kevin, the same question for you? Sure. So, um, you know, as I mentioned before, when we went back and, and built this as part of the RRAP process in 2009, I, I think it would probably be consistent with everybody else. We really needed something that was, you know, industry, sector agnostic, uh, technology agnostic, didn't prescribe any particular security control catalogs. You know, the ISO example was given and really needed it to be flexible and available. Um, you know, it had to be, again, uh, almost a one-size-fits-all, and I, I think I'll hear similar things, though, you know, there would be less mature entities, more mature. Um, we had to build that derivative that, that uh, could, could fit that need. Um, we also chose it because it had a, a critical service focus. So when, we, you know, we go in and we scope a conversation, we're talking to an organization, you know, what are the most critical services to you, the things that really are mission critical or are very important to your business? Without that, you're probably going to have a bad day. Um, of course, we talked about the convergence ideas. You know, we have really good conversations when we bring in that security, that operations, the business continuity folks, as, again, consistent with the other folks in the room, um, we've probably seen that uh, it may not be a group that uh, works together on a daily basis. And then, you know, I mentioned a lightweight derivative, but the, the team, you know, working with SEI and the RMM were able to um, be able to take that menu option of 26 process areas and build it down to 10 uh, that we thought were really applicable and really important for these uh, conversations that we're having with critical infrastructure, you know, focused on, you know, more, more of the cybersecurity, the operation side, the business continuity side. Th thanks, Kevin. So we've talked in a general way now about how your organizations have used RMM. I I'd like to dig a little deeper, and I'll talk about the specifics of how each organization is using RMM. So the question sort of in two parts, which is, um, how are you using RMM? So what are the what are the artifacts or, or methods or, or products that you have based on RMM? And then if you can point to any critical success factors in using RMM. So let's start with, uh, let's start with Bill with that question. Thanks, Matt. So, so I mentioned that our initial goal at Lockheed Martin was to create a measurement capability so that we could sustain the initial assessment that we had done in 2009. Uh, what we did first was we started with a pilot uh, of, of that by looking specifically at IT disaster recovery at a single site uh, and really uh, trying to understand how that process would work. So we did a, a Class C appraisal at the site. Uh, and what we discovered was we got very excellent and comprehensive results. We knew in granular detail how well we were doing with disaster recovery. Um, but the problem with that was that it was also a very costly process. It wasn't, it wasn't as lightweight as what we would like it to be. Uh, but a side effect that we discovered was that it gave us tremendous insight into our command media, or otherwise known as our corporate level policy documents, okay. the, the documents that re require people to do certain things in preparedness. Uh, and so what we did was we took that to the next level. We, we kind of took advantage of that by doing another appraisal later in the year specifically focused on our command media, our policies. Uh, and when we, when we did that, what we, what we ended up with is a, is a set of gaps 
between what our policies would produce versus what RMM would would, would ask for in the practices. Uh, and we were able to use that strategically in our update of command media, update those policies over the next few years. So we updated our business continuity, disaster recovery, crisis management policies. We're actually working on a new policy in the area of medical response, which is a generalization of pandemic planning, uh, working on that today. Um, in 2013, we returned back to the measurement, and what we, what we came to realize at that point uh, was that we really needed to do kind of a hybrid approach between a capability model and a progressive model. Uh, and so coming back to the CERT team, working with David White, uh, we used the frameworks, both of resilience management model and ESC2, M2 electricity, subsector, cybersecurity capability maturity model, which is a mouthful, uh, yeah. ESC2, M2. Uh, and what we did was we adapted the framework of ESC2, M2 with some of the content of RMM and some of the content of our policies to create a lightweight assessment capability with eight domains, only 95 practices, and it's something that we can take to our business areas, our divisions, and in a half a day, do a fairly lightweight assessment, but a meaningful assessment on what their capability is across a number of the areas. So looking at, uh, do we have executive support? Are we creating plans? Are we doing, are we doing the right things that need to be done, incident management and so on? Um, the, the other thing that that gave us was a very good visual approach to displaying the results, transparent yet comprehensive. So we're not missing out on some of the lower level things, uh, but yet seeing all the results at the same time, uh, all in one all in one page. Very very unique result. So so we're in the midst of assessing uh, and expect to complete that in 2014 and present that to our senior executives this year. Great, thanks, Bill. I mean, there seems to be a theme today of of using RMM as a lightweight way of assessing with a great deal of rigor and measurement. So um, you mentioned the ESC2 M2. I'll, I'll ask the question then of, of, of Jason. If you could please just explain um, RMM or its derivatives, um, what, what uh, DOE is currently offering. So as, uh, it's actually really hard to follow up with Bill on that because a lot of what he said is, is really um, what we were aiming with uh, the Department of Energy uh, in ordering to offer the ESC2 M2. Uh, so, as I mentioned before, we already had mandatory cybersecurity standards within the sector. Um, what we didn't want to do is, is have RMM stand out as something that was going to be a new thing for the sector. Uh, we really wanted to leverage the expertise that we already had, the standards that we were already using, um, and we didn't want to have to conflate between a voluntary, uh, what became the esc 2 m 2 the cybersecurity capability maturity model, and the mandatory cybersecurity standards that we had in place. Uh, so we adapted the RMM uh, with the sector input. So I think that was actually really critical for us, was to have subject matter expertise uh, in the room, sitting down with CERT and DOE at the same time, and crafting the language that would eventually become the C2M2. Um, and through that process, that's where we got the, the dual progression model. We also have the, the progression model itself, the sophistication, but also looking at the capability maturity model aspect of, of the institutionalization, the culture that you see as a result of um, putting more assets and resources into your program. So the idea was to have a lightweight one-day facilitation that you'd be able to do with the ESC2M2. And then through that, have a toolkit that could generate a report at the end of that day, um, be able to analyze that. So the evaluation itself takes about six to eight hours. Um, after that, uh, answering a, a glorious 312 uh, question set, you then get a, a scorecard that shows you across 10 domains where your maturity, maturity level is. Um, and so that has actually been very, very valuable for the sector. It's been a consistent way that they've been able to benchmark internally within an organization. Um, and this year we've actually been talking with some organizations about looking at benchmarking outside of the organization. So like utilities may be able to compare themselves to other utilities in a fashion that's, that's anonymized so that we're not dealing with uh, sensitive data or anything like that. But at the same time, gives them a reasonable benchmark of, well, this is where I'm at. Where are you? Um, so to date, we're offering uh, the ESC2M2 as a PDF document. Um, we also have an, a, the toolkit that is provided free of charge, and we also offer facilitated on-site assessments uh, where CERT and DOE will show up on-site to be able to walk through that. Um, just this month, we're actually hoping to finalize the version of the oil and natural gas uh, C2M2. So we took the ESC2M2 to see how does it apply to other sectors. In this case, within the energy sector, we have electricity and oil and natural gas. Um, and that will be uh, finalized soon. The, the great results from that was after a pilot process, everyone said, this works for us. Uh, 95% as is, this, this works for us um, today. So we're very excited um, about all the work that we've been doing so far. And the um, reaction from industry has been really, really positive. 
Uh, to date, we've given out the toolkit to about 100 organizations, which in terms of U.S. customer base uh, for consumers, that's roughly 60 million consumers in the United States that are covered in some way by doing an assessment of the C2M2. Great. Great. Thanks, Jason. Now, Kevin, you've also found success uh, in using RMM. Could you explain the, the offerings or the, the services of your program? Sure. You might have, uh, for folks who are on the webinar, heard, uh, Matt, your presentation, but the, uh, you know, the Cyber Resilience Review is, is, is going to sound very familiar to the, the, the conversation that was just uh, mentioned. But, you know, going in, again, back to 2009, um, an experience that the organization had doing uh, many types of assessments, whether they be physical or um, cybersecurity related, with that 68-hour uh, threshold really was one parameter that was put around that, meaning that that was about the appetite that uh, entities from critical infrastructure had for the government to come in, even in a voluntary fashion, and, and you know, ask in this inter interview-type facilitated manner. Um, so that kind of framed the, really the number of questions, the, the, the way that the, um, we would deliver that uh, derivative product. Um, and ours is done in a manner where we come on site. You know, it's uh, the DHS and uh, SEI folks come on site, facilitate this in a workshop-type setting, um, question and answer, um, uh, day sitting around a conference room and you know when we switched from about two years in maybe not even that long um, people were constantly asking us how do I compare to the other participants um, you know what is my maturity indicator level uh, compared to the other groups that have done this so when we went to quote a version two of the cyber resilience review we built in that uh, maturity indicator levels um, again similar to what you've heard uh, you know other other folks on the webinar today um, and when when we're done with an eight-hour session what we're able to deliver back to those organizations is uh, their maturity compared to the universe of um, entities that have participated you know we don't have enough data to really slice and dice that by a particular sector we can do that in some cases but you know we have to be fair to participants if we've only had two participants in a sector you know we, we just want to be honest about, about that so right now we compare one entity to all um, all those others and again it's you know how they've responded it's, it's how an organization is telling us about this um, uh, within a month we will have uh, a you know the, the method description a you know self-assessment package uh, available for you know anyone who wants to do this on their own so that'll be on the dhs.gov uh, uh, website but um, up until this point it has been a um, where we have come out on site within our you know uh, a certain number allocated per year to do so uh, working with critical infrastructure and state and local entities i'd say you know historically we're about 60% of customers are in the um, you know critical infrastructure space and then the other 40 would be the state and local entities thanks kevin Chris, could you tell us how you've, you've structured products or service offerings at SunGuard using RMM? Yeah, sure. So um, on, on fewest occasions, we'll uh, you know, actually go out for a project that says that this is an RMM assessment. <clears throat> so um, the biggest one we have done was um, you know, a full class C against a global telecommunications company. And that took, that took many months to do. And so that's the exact opposite of the lightweight stuff, which is normally done, really. So, um, you know, the, the model is, is really great with the, the different process areas. You know, I've heard numbers like 10, um, 6 process areas that really are the sweet spot for a specific um, uh, project. So, uh, you know, oftentimes it's built into um, a resilient strategy or a cybersecurity improvement uh, project where, where, where the end results of the report aren't like, oh, you have an RMM benchmark. No, you have a resilient strategy. You have um, you know, a set of recommendations to shore up your cybersecurity, that kind of thing. And, and we, we, we've done a, a global survey on resilience, which, which kind of like goes hand in hand with the RMM. So when we talk about, um, and, and it was uh, for a large part based on some of the theory and, and concepts within RMM. And so, you know, that's, so, so for us, it's not like, oh, you know, here are the three services we do. It, it, it's pretty custom per project. Thank you. So, Michael, uh, earlier, Julia Allen presented on, on a very specific customization of RMM for your organization. I was hoping you could sort of share um, what you've done with RMM, the, the sorts of, of tools and techniques you've constructed using RMM. Sure. Thanks, Matt. Um, actually, uh, think, listening to Kevin and actually Jason, too, Kevin mentioned on level of maturity, and Jason talked about uh, making unique to your organizational needs. Um, and I think like you're, you're referring to in terms of what Julia is talking about, uh, most recently what we've done in 2011, or excuse me, 2013, 
was one of the programs I manage is revenue protection, revenue investigations for the Postal Service. And what we're tasked to do is identify people that uh, may not pay the appropriate amount of postage to us or appropriate amount of revenue. You know, I think it's kind of, um, I don't think anybody would believe that everybody pays the appropriate amount of postage, right? Um, but nonetheless, if they don't, then we come knocking on your door, right? Um, but anyway, we needed, a, we needed a capability within the RMM framework to assess how do we, how do we look at our supply chain from mail induction to mail delivery and everything in between. So what we did is we decoupled the, uh, the supply chain into four specific process areas unique to the organization. We looked at mail induction, mail transportation, uh, mail revenue assurance to, to assure that we're actually getting the entitled revenue that we should be getting, and then finally mail delivery. So we developed, you know, with CERT support and with Julia and team support specifically, those four specific process areas, two of which are actually um, concluded at this point with mail, mail induction and mail revenue assurance. And then as a byproduct of that, what we also did was we created a field instrument looking at tying it back to what I said earlier about how we evaluate products and services. So what we most recently did was develop a field instrument for a specific product to actually deploy to our field divisions, our 17 divisions, so they would go out and effectively assess in the mail induction and the mail revenue assurance practice area or process areas, how effective is our technique and our capability or our level of maturity, tying it back to what Kevin said, how effectively can we actually assure that we're getting the appropriate amount of revenue for that piece of mail in that particular product offering? Um, so we're actually going through the analysis phase of that right now, and that's going to help us identify specific gaps and identify potential solutions going forward to enhance the protection of that particular asset for the organization. Great. Th th thank you, Michael. So I, I think that there's, there's certainly a pattern here, that, that there's a flexibility in RMM. You can construct many things from it, um, and that we're hearing very, very different but related use cases, which is sort of the point of RMM at some level. I was wondering, and I'll open this question up to the, the panel, um, if you could share insights regarding challenges uh, to implementing RMM or using RMM. Um, I think there's lots of folks participating today that are contemplating RMM or trying to understand where it fits. And I was hoping that someone could offer some tips about uh, how best to engage and, and bring RMM into the, your, your product offerings or, or the culture of your organization. Matt, I'll take it. Thanks, Evan. Um, sorry to me to talk over you there, but I, I think, Matt, I would say maybe less of a challenge and more just saying maybe take off, uh, bite off manageable chunks, um, you know, look at a process area or two. Um, and, and, and go through that. I mean, the, obviously, as, as the folks in the room and on the webinar probably would recognize that it's a, it's a large thing. It's a large model. And to just say, I'm going to attack all of it at once and uh, bring that in and implement it, I mean, certainly it's possible. But, um, you know, you, you're going to bring in new language. You're going to bring in new, potentially new concepts, uh, maybe even new ways of building business processes. So maybe, you know, maybe uh, more manageable chunks of uh, process area two at a time, as I said, see what that does, see what the measurements come out of that, uh, see what kind of improvements uh, can or can't be made, and, and go from there. Thanks, Evan. This is Bill. Let me uh, add on to what Kevin was saying. When we were doing our studies of our uh, policies, we were looking at probably 15 or 16 process areas. So, you know, we weren't able to kind of narrow it down from that perspective. And so what we did was organizationally trying to chunk it out by having two or three experts in the area and having the rest of the people who are involved in that update of, of policy, which was probably 30 or 40 people, not be directly exposed to RMM. So we sent a couple people to class, and the others, we kind of gave them the amount of information internally that they needed. So again, just limiting the scope, but from a different perspective. Yeah, and beyond scope, uh, sorry, Matt. No, please. Um, beyond scope, um, which definitely is a challenge, I would say that one of the things that that we were viewing, um, and, and I'll use the verbal judo and say not a challenge, but an opportunity, um, was for the, to have all that buy-in and have all that dialogue that would need to take place in order to adapt the RMM if that's what you choose to do. Um, so for us to be able to have a five-month process where we were able to get subject matter experts, where we had you know, 30 who had all-day workshops, another 60 that were reviews uh, across the sector, uh, was, it was a really big deal for us. And then to then pilot what we, what we came up with, um, in that short period of time, I think was uh, opportunities uh, for success on that. 
but they definitely did impose uh, on themselves a, a uh, level of rigor and work that needed to be accomplished in that. Thanks. Yeah, it, it sounds like um, there's sort of consensus that uh, approaching it in a gradual way makes sense, right? That um, it, it, it is a, a very large body of work, and, and doing it in, in one, one foul swoop is really very difficult. Um, uh, just a quick question. I'll throw this out to the group. Um, what would you like to see in RMM in the future? What's not there now that you'd like to see? <laughs> so, pretty, pretty comprehensive. Now, we'll interpret that silence here in Pittsburgh as that it's been completely <laughs> optimized and nothing needs to be changed, modified, or improved. Well, you know what? Uh, this is Chris. Uh, Whenever I get into discussions about RMM internally here at SunGuard, it's like, um, it's not like everybody, so um, this conversation, we all kind of know what RMM is, but many times when I start the conversation, it's like, what's RMM? What's it all about? So, you know, I have to come at it from, you know, these folks know what they do. They know their silos, but they don't know what RMM is necessarily, and they, everybody has a different idea of what resilience is. So I have to, you know, one of the things that, you know, to answer your question is maybe, you know, you know, RMM for dummies, kind of what's the approach? So for me, it's, it's a business approach about lower cost and lower risk. You know, how do you improve resilience with the low cost, low risk message? And it's, it's not about, oh, gee whiz, how many process areas do you want to do for me, Chris? It's, it's more like, uh, you know, I've got limited budget, I've got limited time, I've got no staff time. How are you going to come in and make me more resilient? And so RMM is a tool in the package, and... And so I, I guess, you know, with that kind of thought process, maybe some kind of tool or artifact that can take somebody from, you know, zero knowledge of what RMM is, start out with it, you know, and I know we, we have presentations that do that, but that's just a, a comment sure. from my direction. Oh, th thank you. It's very important to, to hear. Um, just a, another sort of related question, I, I think, which is, you know, Chris, you described the needing to explain what RMM is and setting the context. Um, do you find, and this is a question for the panel, do you find that the concept of resilience or resilience as a term is resonating with your, with your stakeholders and customers? I'll start and get be really quick. Yes, it is. And then the very next thing you have to do is define what they mean because everybody has a little bit different meaning. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd say for the end, you can deal with catastrophic weather uh, events. Uh, that that dictate that you need resiliency on the operations side. I think that what has been unique in, in recent times is now talking about resiliency on the cybersecurity and IT focus as well. And where that merger, because when we say operations side, we have uh, SCADA systems, so supervisory uh, control and data acquisition, that can't do the same stuff that traditional IT systems can. So we're actually seeing now a confluence where there's a lot more IT equipment being put into the grid that's introducing new risk that wasn't being addressed 20, 40, 30 years ago because they didn't have the capabilities that we have now. So in order to, to address that, having the resiliency conversation has become very, very important. And, uh, Matt, if I could also interject, too, that um, in terms of resilience, I think contextually we, we, we always think of, uh, like Jason said, you know, we handle emergency response for the organization, too. So we always sort of want to think of in terms of how resilient are we in our – right? But I think what we're starting to learn, and it's a slow, gradual learning acceptance process, is how does resilience actually relate and correlate back to other activities within the organization? Um, so when we, when we look at our investigative steps, our investigative process within our portfolio of investigations like mail fraud, theft, burglars, robberies, can we build resilient activities around those processes so that, you know, you have somebody, a new inspector comes in, and they're just as effective and productive within two weeks as somebody that has 20 years of tenure. So how do we, how do we coin resilience around those activities? Right. It's a really interesting observation. It seems to me that if we look at cyber resilience or resilience, operational resilience, as an extension of existing concepts. So this is sort of that theme of, of this is an augmentation or utilization of existing capabilities within an organization. Uh, that could be compelling, that it's, it's not a new overlay. It's a new way to look. Uh, at the things that matter most in an organization. Shane, are you ready for that question from the audience? We are ready. I'll feed it to you, Matt, maybe for distribution okay. to, to the panel then. From Thomas asking, does anyone on the panel use actual historical incident metrics compared against the RMM mail metrics to see if RMM affects actual incidents in terms of volume or severity? Sure. So the question is about comparison and looking at data. And the question is, is anyone using, in this case, uh, Thomas was asking about incident data. 
comparing incident data to mill levels to basically uh, measure the efficacy of the practices in RMM? It's a very uh, I'll, I'll specific start. question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll start with that. So uh, Julia Allen contacted us because we have like 35 years of that kind of data, right? So we started down that road, and um, you know, I think where we're at today is really understanding what the metrics in the fields and the values are to, to do that in a meaningful way. And so that's a hard thing to do. But um, so, you know, we're looking at that data. We're looking at data we, we gathered over time and, and, and think working with uh, Carnegie Mellon and thinking of SEI and thinking about, you know, wh what's the right data we need to capture going forward when these incidents happen? So the answer is, yeah, we're trying. Okay. Chris, could you elaborate just a little on how that, what that's looking like currently? How, how, how do you go about starting that process of doing a comparison between practice and, and incident data? So we have all this incident data, right? So, you know, folks declare uh, they have an event, all kind, whatever kind of event that is, whether it's weather or man-made. And, um, you know, we collect data like, you know, what was the event? How did it affect them? How long were they down? What was the recovery time? What was the recovery point? What did they achieve? What were the lessons learned? So we have a big old spreadsheet with all these, these incidents in them. And then we looked at the, the model, and, and working with Julia and the team, it was, um, you know, how do, how, do we, how do we say, okay, we went in and did uh, an RMM-type assessment, and what is the efficacy of doing that? Well, how long have we been doing it? You know, maybe a year? So, and how many projects have we done? Pretty, not statistically significant, right? So I think, I think what we need to do, you know, as an industry, uh, folks on the panel and, and, and coordinated by uh, the RMM folks, is to, is to start gathering that data and, and do, that, do that proper analysis. I think that, um, you know, proving the efficacy of, of an assessment and a strategy program is really, really hard. So, so I think really, really smart people like RMM have got to figure out how to prove that. Yeah, it, it's definitely, it, it's a challenge, and it's, it's not unique to RMM or, or the SEI, right? This is, I think there's a, there's a perennial measurement challenge in cybersecurity. And I, I'm optimistic that RMM uh, can play a significant role in, in helping to answer some of those questions. Shane, another question from the audience? Yes, from Carl asking, how important uh, do the panelists weigh the depth of SME experience on the appraisal team versus having more generalist appraisers good at asking questions of, then, uh, of the in-house SMEs? Okay, so we've got a few folks on the panel that, that, that put people in the field or within the organization uh, to, to do assessments or appraisals using RMM. So the question is, how much does SME experience or expertise matter when you're using something like RMM? I'll just open up uh, to the, for the Yeah, I'll say for, for the energy sector, um, it, there's a, it matters a lot, actually. Um, whenever we go on a facilitation, uh, one of the questions that, that we ask at the end of it is, um, you know, the goal being to get to the point where the utilities themselves are doing the self-assessments, right? Uh, with 3,200 utilities in the United States, me only being one person, to have me go visit everybody, that would take quite a long time. Um, and so in order to, to help with that, we're actually working on a facilitator's guide. And we're, when we're trying to build it out, we're asking, well, what would you need to be able to do this? Um, and a lot of the, the response we got back was it says by expertise. Um, for example, to be able to talk about the critical, critical infrastructure protection standards, the mandatory cybersecurity standards I was discussing before, uh, within the an energy sector, electricity sector, is really important. Uh, you have to be able to say that the risk that you say for uh, your SIP standards is not necessarily the same risk that we're talking about when we talk about cybersecurity risk. And so to be able to have that dialogue, you do need to have a lot of system matter expertise. Um, you'd also be very insightful if you were able to discuss uh, disaster recovery um, and business continuity as well. So we, we do rely on uh, a lot of smart folks in order to help us with our facilitations. Other thoughts to the panel? I'd echo, I'd echo the same, Matt, and, and that I think that from the DHS perspective, it lends a little, you know, a lot of credibility. You know, if you uh, bring someone in that's uh, you know, at least um, – cognizant of the terminology of a particular sector, uh, the technology that may be in play, rather than asking a lot of, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one type level questions about the industry that you're going in to um, discuss about, uh, it makes a big difference. Um, you know, obviously you need to understand the content, the RMM and all that as well, but, you know, again, you need to be able to put, put in context the uh, organizations that you're going to and be able to sort of put yourselves in their shoes from our, from our experience. Matt, this is Bill. I'd like to take that question as well. What, what we found as we go around our different business areas, uh, and Lockheed Martin has a very diverse 
uh, portfolio. So if you think of uh, services that we provide to the government um, versus uh, things like planes and rockets, right? So there's a very diverse set of products. And the business models that are being protected by business continuity and IT disaster recovery as a result are very different. And so their approaches to preparedness are different. And so what we find is not only do we need to have a subject matter in the model, uh, subject matter expert in the model come help facilitate, they also need to know something about that business area. It's very important to help them interpret what the model is asking for when they're measuring um, as they're evaluating those questions. A follow-on question then, Bill. So you've described these, these different operating entities and they all have their, their specific um, requirements and constructs and, and context. Uh, do you find that any specific area or line of business is more challenging than another when you're applying something like RMM? No, they all have their challenges. They're just different okay. challenges. And just they, different they challenges. Take different approaches. They take different approaches to preparedness. If we think about business continuity, one group might start at the facility level and move on to products and services. Another might start at a functional level and move into other areas. Uh, so they take different approaches, but ultimately they still are responsible for the same level of preparedness. And so we're measuring them against the same measures in the end, but how you get to the answer, sometimes uh, the, the discussion takes a different path. Thank you. Shane, a question from the audience? We do. A two-part question, so I'll just ask the first part since uh, it may take a little bit of time. But from David asking... We, like many organizations, have separate departments, disaster recovery, business continuity, risk management, IT operations management. What are some of the first steps to begin the convergence to get everyone working together towards a common goal of operational resilience? Okay, and that's a great question. So how do you, how do you start that process, that evolution, that everyone sort of agreed is important? Or how do we, we get all of the folks um, that are responsible for and manage a critical service or a critical line of business speaking in the same language about these challenges? Matt, this is, this is Bill. Let me take that one again as well. I don't mean sure. to hog the line here, but uh, that, that's a challenge that we absolutely faced. We were very stovepiped. If, again, setting aside cybersecurity, we were focused on business continuity, disaster recovery, and crisis management with, as it turned out, three different organizations not really talking to each other too much. So, so the first step was to get them talking to each other. So we built a network of subject matter experts that were responsible for these disciplines and brought them together on a regular basis. Uh, and then we started looking at the command media, and the command media was divergent as well, the, the policies. And so as we were using RMM to evaluate the gaps in our command media, what we found was they needed to be integrated. So we needed to have points at which business continuity, disaster recovery, and crisis management people were working together, uh, required to work together, uh, and, and we've evolved from there. So, so again, getting the... Getting the communications going is the first step, uh, but then also providing guidance on where we specifically wanted people to work together and collaborate uh, helped as well. Thank you. And, and Matt, if I could add on to that too, I think Kevin talked about um, you know looking at it from the angle of not taking on too much. You know, I mean, RMM is very big, right? 26 process areas, and what we've had success with is we started out small, so we've kind of descoped it into specific aspects of RMM that we would actually want to focus on within our group, attain uh, small success, almost as like a baby step approach, and then ultimately our vision is to expand into other groups within our organization, ultimately attaining a, a cultural operation resilience across the entire organization enterprise-wide. Thank you. Shane, let's go to part two of that question. And part two from David was asking, it was mentioned that uh, CERT RMM can be more effective with the appropriate tool. Is there softwares out there available to help implement RMM? So I, I think that, that that question sort of has multiple facets to it. I think the question about sort of RMM itself is probably a question for the SEI cert. And I think the panelists have probably described the ways in which they're offering tools and, and techniques to, to stakeholders to use RMM. Um, so earlier in the day, there was a presentation regarding RMM itself, uh, use cases for RMM, um, sort of in a, in a form neutral of any specific use case. Um, currently, there, there are tools in the form of, of support materials and education, but, but not a, a technical platform. There isn't a, uh, an RMM app yet, for instance, um, that, that you can download and use. I wanted to ask the panel a question uh, about supply chain. So this, this term or this, this, this subject came up quite a bit in presentations today. Um, so... When you think about RMM and you think about the ways that, that assets are 
divided and categorized people, facilities, information, technology. Um, it's always sort of implicit the supply chain sort of lives between these or, or with these. Um, I was interested if anyone on the panel has, has specifically uh, addressed supply chain as a subject with RMM. All right, so within the C2M2, uh, we actually uh, have a domain that is for external dependencies management and supply chain management. Um, and what's been interesting about that is seeing kind of firsthand going to utilities and doing these evaluations is that they're, they're looking at the supply chain behind them, uh, but realizing they also are supplying services in front of them, too. So uh, a lot of the conversations that we end up having that's been uh, kind of unique, I think, has been discussing, well, while we're also seeing what, what, what services that we need in order to run and operate are, are fuel uh, and when we go to IT, who's providing our services, um, but then who do we need, how do we interact with the customer? Um, is that customer interaction just at the meter uh, where you're tapping into electricity, or is there also, do we have to worry about our website? Is that, is that a supply chain dependency? Um, and so we, we've focused it on the, on the topic areas within the electricity sector within that domain in the C2M2, um, and it's given a lot of good dialogue as a result because we haven't had standards in electricity yet that have really discussed supply chain. Uh, we have a lot of uh, some voluntary guidance, but this is actually one of the first times that we're doing this in an evaluation method, um, which has had a lot of really interesting results. I'd say the same, Matt, for us at uh, DHS, looking at um, bolstering the external dependencies management uh, domain that we look at, and, and um, that's, you know, a, a current, current activity that we're doing now and looking at uh, spending more time with that for customers that are looking for that. Again, it's just uh, the things mentioned before, uh, the dependency on those uh, entities providing you services or things that without their um, you know, uh, assistance or help or um, relationship, you're going to have a challenging day. So, uh, you know, how to best manage that, how to, how to rank and prioritize those folks. Um, we're looking at that as, again, as a additional area of focus, whether it be standalone or part of the existing CRR is uh, TBD over the next few months. Yeah, we look, at, we look at supply chain as one of the, the fifth asset class. You know, you mentioned people process technology facilities, supply chain. I mean, yeah, you can look at external dependencies as a process itself, but all the processes apply. So you have to, we, we think of it as, you know, the fifth asset class. Great, thanks. It certainly seems like there's a desire uh, in organizations to understand dependencies and these very complicated interdependencies that exist, both upstream and downstream. So, I mean, I, I firmly believe that, that RMM can assist with, with that challenge. Um, a related question, um, you know, cloud has become somewhat of a cliched term, but... I was wondering if anyone's ever approached you gentlemen and said, um, we need to do RMM for the cloud, or how does cloud um, influence the way that RMM can be deployed? Maybe. So we've, uh, we've been tackling that internally with uh, IT disaster recovery. Uh, and again, the foundation of our disaster recovery and business continuity program are that gap analysis we did with RMM a few years ago. Uh, and, and actually we're, uh, in the middle of a data center migration within Lockheed Martin, we're moving from dozens of target dozens of data centers into three target data centers. And as we do that, essentially we're building a cloud inside of Lockheed Martin, uh, and needing to figure out how to uh, differentiate between application uh, support and infrastructure support, and how to do preparedness across that. And, and Again, the concepts of RMM and the, the dependency analysis, the asset classes, the tie back to the business processes that RMM calls for, uh, products and services, uh, it all still applies. It's just that there's another layer of complexity there. So, so Bill, when you, you, you're going through this process of, of, of basically changing assets, right, or consolidating assets, um, can you speak to how RMM was used in the in the risk management process when you were uh, evaluating various scenarios to, for that consolidation? Uh, maybe let me take a slightly different approach. Sure. So one of the things that we did in our, uh, very strongly in our business continuity policy is call out different asset classes, one being uh, you know, people, facilities, information. And then what we did with technology was we, was we separated it into information technology and then other technology assets like things that might support manufacturing or, you know, other specialized equipment. And so we have our own asset class for IT, uh, which then diverges into the disaster recovery. So as we were, uh, as we were looking at uh, implementing the target data centers, we were, number one, improving strategically our capability for recovery by being able to have 
massive amounts of capability in centralized places, as opposed to before where we sometimes had to depend on external entities for recovery. Uh, so it improved our risk posture, but then also um, kind of complicated the assessment by uh, virtualizing a lot of the infrastructure. Great, thanks. Shane, questions from the audience? We do. Another one from uh, Michael asking, uh, many companies in the past used CMM or CMMI, uh, used internal assessments, internal assessments to subjectively slant the maturity levels toward achieving a certain contract or renewal requirement. Is there any explicit external auditing system in place for RMM to enforce objectivity in this regard? Sure. So before I turn over to the panel, I think I draw a distinction, which is um, the two are just inherently different. We're not, there, there isn't a, I shouldn't say it quite so, so definitively, but typically you don't see a specific mandate as you did in contracts for, for software development to be a certain capability level. So I think the situation is just different. Um, and I think that um, the scampy method, the appraisal method, is designed to, to introduce rigor and to prevent that sort of bias in the system. So I'll turn the question over to the panel um, with that sort of filter, which is I, I don't know that the question is, is I think there's just a, a basic difference that makes that question difficult to answer in its, its raw form. But there's a corollary, which is the crosswalk that's provided with RMM. So if there's a requirement to implement like a NIST standard for cybersecurity or uh, like the ISO 22301 for business continuity, if we've already understood our gaps from an RMM perspective, then we can cross-reference using that crosswalk to those other standards, and then we automatically know our capability to those standards. So, so if there's going to be an external certification body coming in looking at us, you know, understandably that's a long process, and what you want to do is kind of be able to fill your gaps before they come. You'll at least know what to work on by using RMM ahead of time. Yeah, I'd like to piggyback on that. We actually did a uh, crosswalk for HIPAA for that exact reason. Yeah, I think there's a really important element where you, if you can evaluate once and apply many times, right? So if you know um, this practice is, if you know the status of this practice, then you can understand your disposition relative to a number of different bodies of practice or standards. Um, so I think that's, that's a really important element of this. Kevin, you mentioned a crosswalk uh, relative to this, the CRR. Uh, so I was going to ask this question of, of Jason and Kevin, which is the NIST cybersecurity framework um, is a hot topic. Uh, we know the final framework should be released in, in, in February. I was wondering if you gentlemen could offer any thoughts regarding how RMM or your derivative products could be used in support of that framework. Sure. The, um, for specific to the CRR, it's uh, you know, one of the uh, capabilities that the department will have available if an uh, you know, organization out there in the critical infrastructure world or state and local world wants um, uh, you know, assistance looking at the framework, looking at how to use it, how to build a cybersecurity program, how to do risk management, how to participate both externally and internally with the organization. Um, the CRR is the tool by which we will, we will be doing that. Um, you know, uh, there's many things that we'll bring to the table, um, but, uh, you know, if, if owner operators can come to us, so that crosswalk I reference will have, uh, again, the, the, um, once it's finalized in this framework and as it's mapped out uh, against the CRR, they're not the same thing, of course, um, but, you know, the, there's, there's a, you know, you're going to see enough in the crosswalk that, uh, again, it's, it's very similar. I'll just say ditto. Um, <laughs> Well, what it comes down to with the framework is that the framework is, um, since it's cross-sector, there are going to be a lot of tools in the toolkit that you could be able to use to apply to the, to the framework. And so CRR is obviously one of them. C2M2 is one of the approaches that we're looking at for the energy sector. Uh, at the end of the day, though, one of the things that we're going to be doing is engaging the asset owner and operators uh, on writing that implementation guidance for the framework. So they can call out more tools than just the C2M2 if they desire to do that. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, we've already done a mapping. Um, we know that there is a good linkage there. So um, we have support for that system already. We've already been doing the C2M2. Um, so we're just looking to, to engage in the sector on the next steps. Great. Thank you. Uh, Shane, I think we probably have time for one more question. We do, and actually we have one more question here in the queue, and that question from VJ asking, if, the operation, if operation resilience could be, defined, could be defined as a factor of realized risk, how do we measure the limit practically? Okay, I think we need a whiteboard for this, but um, <laughs> uh, no, I'll just, you know what, this is, this is where the moderator gets to just panel. Could you, anyone have thoughts regarding that question? Uh, you know, I, I don't know that I could answer specifically, I mean, but 
we tell folks that at the end of the day, use these results to help yourself improve weathering a bad day. So I don't have a, a scientific answer for that because the DHS, it's all voluntary. Um, it's, it's by no means is it audit. Um, you know, we're spending it a day with an organization, so I don't want to make it something it's not. But at the end of the day, is if you can help build practices and capabilities that help you weather a bad day or, you know, an incident event, whatever you want to call it, um, th that's a good thing. And I'll just add to that, too, that, you know, if you look at RMM and applying RMM from on, on the risk angle in terms of identifying your level of risk for the organization, um, you should apply at least, you know, where we're going with it is apply RMM practices to the level of acceptable risk that you are you're okay with for your organization. Yeah, and what I wanted to add was that uh, everything we're talking about today, the common thread through all this is operational risk management, right? So for you know, being part of a large corporation, we have enterprise risk management, which steers down into cybersecurity, business resiliency, uh, and a number of other factors. Um, risk ultimately is the common thread across all of these disciplines. And RMM helps us quantify that risk and deal with it in a number of different ways. Yeah, I mean, it's all about um, creating certainty in your operations and processes to, to ensure that you're there um, and, and you're delivering on your mission. Um, so I think at this point we need to wrap up the panel. I'd like to thank our panelists today. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, fantastic insights, and I think you'd really help folks that are contemplating RMM uh, or are current users and are looking to expand their usage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, folks, that's going to wrap up the pa panel. Matt, thank you for great facilitation. I'd like to thank the panelists as well.